hello and welcome. And hopefully you can hear us both fine today. We've had one or two technical difficulties, but hopefully we have not been able to get round them. Um, as most of you will know, my name is uh, Jeremy Glover, and it's my pleasure to introduce our latest Fennec Elliott webinar. And our webinar today is a companion to the one we held back in August, where we started our discussion on climate change and the role of legislation, case law, contracts and technology um, along the UK's journey towards net zero. It should always be a timely topic, but obviously, um, all the more so today with the ongoing COP26 conference in Glasgow. Um, I'm joined today by, again, someone very familiar to you, um, one of Fennec Elliott's own experts in the field, Dr. Stacey Sinclair, who leads our technology and innovation initiatives, collaborating and engaging with clients on new digital technologies in the construction industry. And those technologies are very important. Um, as, as we move towards the drive towards um, net zero. Um, so just a reminder, as always, um, you're on mute. Please do send us any questions and we'll do our best to get to them um, at the end. And you should be able to find the slides on our site um, later on in the week. We'll hope to try and send you a, a link to those. So moving on to the next slide. Now, to be absolutely clear, this is not a webinar about COP26. It absolutely is not a webinar about politicians' promises. They'll promise the world and then we'll see later what this actually means in terms of legislation. We've had other webinars about green technologies and the advances needed to achieve net zero. But what we want to do today is consider with you um, some of the changes you might see as a result of the move towards um, carbon. And don't forget resource neutrality, both to the procurement process and also to your construction contract. And Stacey is going to start us off with a look at procurement. Thank you, Jeremy. And um, I just want to say, I'm seeing a couple of questions come in around Jeremy's sound. That is one of the technical difficulties we're having. Um, so if you could um, perhaps bear with us, let us know how it goes in due course and, and we shall see what we can do. Um, but with that, I'm going to crack on um, with procurement. Thank you, Jeremy, and welcome everyone again um, to today's session. So for those of us who are tuned into and um, passionate about the topic of net zero and the importance of climate change, we of course have heard a lot about how the construction industry is just such a large contributor of greenhouse gas emissions and is such a big part to play in achieving net zero targets. Now, I hope it goes without saying that if projects are going to achieve these targets and sustainable outcomes, such as minimizing the use of resources and energy, reducing waste and increasing biodiversity, um, strategic and detailed consideration of the planning, design, and fundamentally the procurement is needed right from the outset of any project be it a new build project or refurbishment of existing assets, which is ever so important now. And following on from procurement, the contracts themselves, of course, which we will um, come on to later on. So we can see that the government is aligned with this view of you need to get it right from the outset, including procurement. And I say this because of the construction play, the construction playbook. Now, this was published back in a year ago, December 2020. Many of you are probably familiar with it already. Now, those who are not familiar, um, the playbook sets out the government's guidance on the sourcing and contracting of public works. And it has a focus on getting it right, right from the start with numerous references to procurement throughout. Now, first I have on the screen here, I think you should be able to see, um, this is right at the outset of the playbook and it's called it's, um, as one section on building back greener. Now, what this is about is it's an overarching sustainability framework um, and talks about systems and processes should be in place to ensure their projects and programs deliver the targets set. And it's talking about contracting authorities need to adopt the use of whole life carbon assessments, reference to PAUSE 2080, if you haven't seen it before, to understand and minimize the greenhouse gas emissions footprint of projects 
and programs throughout the life cycle. Now that's really setting the tone here. Then we go um, on to modern methods of construction within the playbook. Now this, this is really interesting in, in my view. Um, here, procurement is the enabler and at the heart of it all with modern methods of construction that's referenced in the playbook. The playbook highlights the need for procurement to support investment in modern methods of construction. For example, adopting longer term contracting and favoring offsite construction. Now, the playbook also introduces procuring construction programs based on something called product platforms. Now, what is a product platform? A platform comprising standardized and interoperable components and assemblies the requirements for which will be a digital component catalog. Now, this is fundamentally, fundamentally different um, to what most of us are seeing now. Um, it goes on to say that contracting authorities should collaborate to find opportunities, not only for their own platform solutions, but also for ways in which cross-sector platform solutions can be applied. For example, by using platforms that enable interoperability of components across different sectors. Now, you know, as I said a moment ago, this idea of a product platform, fundamentally different, different in terms of design and different in terms of how we're going to be procuring. Here we have the, this idea of designers using pre-designed components from other designers and this extending into manufacturing. Now, whilst this is novel for the construction industry at the moment, it is of course not novel elsewhere um, in, man, in the manufacturing world, the automotive industry and so forth. But to come to terms with this in construction may take some time, collaboration, teamwork, changing of mindsets here. And of course, um, this raises legal and practical commercial questions, such as who's going to be responsible for this digital component catalog? Who's going to keep it up to date? Are there going to be issues with interoperability? Big question here that, I've heard lots of discussion around intellectual property rights for these digital components um, that are going to be used across a number of projects. And how about um, defective design versus defective manufacturing? An age old question, this is not a new question, it comes up time and time again. Are there, is this going to be more complicated with this idea of a, of a product platform? Possibly, possibly not. Um, there's going to be other questions and no doubt this is a whole topic for a future session. And I'm getting more feedback in a second. Um, there we go. So yeah, a large topic, lots of issues we need to consider, but I just wanted to point out here the significant change in procurement that the construction playbook is highlighting. Now, something else I wanted to um, move on to in the construction playbook, effective contracting, um, uh, an another very important section within this. Um, and it, it talks about how contracting authorities should, with their advisors, establish the most appropriate commercial approach and procurement strategy that optimizes long-term value and involves all team members early enough for them to contribute to this value. Now, it also goes on to say that before issuing the tender, stress testing and peer reviewing draft contracts, particularly to, check, particularly to check for unintended consequences. Now that's interesting. I mean, what we're, what we're talking about here is involving advisors, involving the whole design team, the whole advisory team earlier in the project. Um, and it goes on to say, to ensure that the contract terms are not unintentionally limiting innovation, sustainable supply chains, or investment in modern methods of construction. So this, this idea really comes back to that point of, of team working, bringing everyone together early at the outset of a project, engaging the supply chain, the designers and advisors to stress test and peer review contracts and strategies. And indeed, at the end of the construction playbook, we've got figure four, which highlights just how important it is to consider these, um, these legal issues and have a legal awareness throughout the, um, the whole process of the 14 key policies that the construction playbook outlines. So these are just a few of the points on from the construction playbook on procurement. There are a number of others. 
um, as well as suggestions for contracts and contract obligations, including a suggestion of a project scorecard, uh, which, which is suggested to form part of the contractual documentation, a baseline for a robust post-completion evaluation. So I do encourage you to read the playbook, which is available free online. Um, really important for the construction industry going forward. So moving on, that was December 2020, a year ago. Move forward to July 2021. And we, um, I can see the slides, apologies. Um, what we have is the then UK construction minister, Anne-Marie Trevelin, who I've mispronounced my apologies. Um, she listed three government actions to ensure contractors commit to reducing carbon contributions. Now, um, one, a carbon exclusion measure, or in other words, a warning that companies without net zero plans or without a commitment to net zero will be barred from bidding for public sector work. The policy will apply to contracts over 5 million. Then she spoke about a national procurement policy statement where the public sector buyers must consider how their procurement can tackle climate change and reduce waste. And then she spoke of a government evaluation process, a requirement for central government departments to expressly evaluate environmental, social, and economic benefits during the procurement process. Um, now, then we get to September 2021. We have PPN 0621, which came into force on the 30th of September. And here, the key issue to be assessed is whether the bidder has taken steps to understand their environmental impact and carbon footprint relevant to the delivery of the contract. So again, we've got, this is applying to um, apologies, I just cannot see the screen here. This is applying to the procurement of goods and services with an anticipated contract value averaging over 5 million per annum under the, co the public contract regulations 2015. And the selection criteria must take account of the bidding company's carbon reduction plan as set out in a template carbon reduction plan. Now, this CRP should be published on a website and provided within 30 days to anyone who requests it. So again, it's this key issue of, you know, has a bidder taken steps to understand their environmental impact? Now, um, this CRP does not replace existing reporting or calculation of an organization's carbon footprint, but rather it's a summary document to demonstrate compliance. Um, and it does, if there is a guidance note that does set out in, in which cases a supplier should only be excluded. So I do encourage you to have a look at that, that procurement policy note as well as the guidance. Um, now, one final point I wanted to note before I hopefully can um, hand back to Jeremy if technology is working for us, um, is the sustainability, sustainability disclosure requirements. Um, on the 1st of July, 2021, the, ex the Chancellor of the Exchequer um, set out a plan to introduce new sustainability disclosure requirements. Um, now, these represent additional disclosure requirements to those required by the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, the TCFD framework. Um, and really, it's the government's aim um, for these SDRs to be fully integrated, a fully integrated regime that works smoothly across all sectors of the economy, um, aiming for mandatory disclosure and annual reports. Now, query what impact this will have on construction, uh, but no doubt it will impact future developments um, and financing, and therefore something to look out for. So now with that, we are hoping to move on to potential contract clauses. Let's see what we can do about the okay. audio. So, Stacey, can now, everyone... Now, I cannot hear Jeremy, but I'd be very interested to know if the audience can hear Jeremy. Can, yeah. Can people hear me? Sadly, no? maybe, Jeremy, you can give me a phone. Okay, I'll try that. Apologies. Let me see. Our sincere apologies. Oh, the audience can hear Jeremy. 
Jeremy, now the audience can hear you. I cannot. So I'm pleased that the audience can hear us both. And I'm just going to hand it over to you. And maybe the difficulty here is going to be moving the slides. So I'm going to try and give you power to move the slides. And we'll see how we get on. OK. Um, but this is Jeremy, if you want to start, possibly, and I'll try and give you power. OK. OK. Um, all right. Well, thank, thank you, Stacey. And it's good to, that everyone can actually hear me. Um, and apologies again for the, 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 the small difficulty. Um, I suppose that a, a short headline to deal with your contracts is that, let's be honest, the contractual landscape when it comes to dealing with green issues at the moment is... Quickly, we can expect to see a large number of contractual obligations as we move towards um, the net zero obligations in your contracts. And this is going to be focused across everything, going through design obligations, the construction and operation phases. And yes, of course, we're going to see requirements set out in your specification. But I think it's going to be more than that. So let's have a think about some of the issues, um, some of the contractual issues that we, we will need to be thinking about. Um, there's the pretend, pretender. Um, the has already given you an, an insight into that. Um, dealing with um, benchmarking um, contractors' carbon um, um, footprint. Um, we could be looking at requirements to use sustainable working practices, adhering to sustainability policies or sustainable action plans. Well, that's all right, isn't it? But what does that actually mean? What is a sustainable working practice? It's going to be different things to different people. So this is where it's going to be important for clarity, definition, making sure that people understand exactly what is required of them. And it's also going to be very important that you back to back these obligations with subcontractors and suppliers. And I think one thing that we're going to see a lot of, there's going to be a lot about um, contractors or subcontractors um, using or making reasonable endeavours to achieve whatever the standard is, the XYZ standard. Um, and it's going to be understandable resistance to use of the word must. And of course, there's going to be a lot of um, variance here. Um, so I think it's worth just recapping um, the idea in relation to um, best endeavours. I mean, the options, I mean, we all know they range from a contractor saying, well, I'll try, um, I'll do my best. And they go through the reasonable endeavours, all reasonable endeavours, leading up to the absolute um, must obligation. But looking at best endeavours, one of the more one of the ones higher up, one of the more serious ones. Um, it's important to remember um, that it's not an um, absolute obligation. Um, contractors not entitled to go beyond the realms of what would be um, reasonable. Um, and you don't have to include actions which would lead to um, financial ruin. You don't have to do things that wouldn't be successful. But what you do have to do is document what you do. If you've got an obligation to use any type of endeavours, of course, this is basic contract stuff. It's not just um, the green sustainable issues. And that's one of the important things to remember. Of course, we're talking about new obligations because they deal with net zero or carbon neutrality or resource neutrality. Um, but, you know, a lot of it's they're sort of following the, sort of usual, the usual contract standards as you would understand them in dealing with other issues. And a key is going to be... Um, reporting obligations. I mean, it's going to be one of the one of the, the, the big things. We were talking about people submitting audits. Um, how do you monitor compliance? Well, the contractor's got to report what they're doing, and then someone else is going to actually monitor that compliance. And so something else that we're going to see, um, we're going to see em embedded targets into the contracts. Now, again, the, the concept is nothing new. It's just what those targets are going to be. So you, you might see performance related liquidated damages. And the converse of that is some kind of pain gain um, incentives for achieving specific sustainability targets. But ultimately, you know, the, the kicker, they might lead to suspension rights or termination rights um, for um, non-compliance with those plans. And I think something else that we are going to see, we're going to see um, reference to a carbon budget. Um, and by this, I suppose we're talking about the carbon footprint um, or the car, um, um, carbon footprint um, budget. Um, this is project based 
Um, oh, I'm talking about, there's a lot of talk about national targets or global targets. Um, and buildings, uh, you know, the, the classic from World, World um, Green Building Council, buildings currently responsible for 39%, 40% of the um, global energy related carbon emissions. And the idea of the carbon budget, it's one way to help deal with this issue. Um, you may again see adjustment clauses, incentives to reduce the carbon budget. Um, but um, what it is, it's all part of the process of ensuring that parties consider what steps they need to take to reduce the carbon footprint of the project um, generally. Um, and again, it's new. Everyone needs to be clear. Everyone needs to understand what the words being used are. Is there going to be a distinction between production and consumption based accounting? And if we're using units to assess the greenhouse gas emissions, um, well, what units are we agreed to be using? And we're we just going to talk about um, greenhouse gas emissions. Now, another of the issues, again, and I, I think it's an issue where it doesn't matter too much if people are getting carried away, but you know, you, to some degree, you can only take small steps. So maybe to begin with, you're just looking at greenhouse gas emissions, but the idea of carbon budgets, the idea of sustainable budgets or whatever, um, they could become become wider. And it's all about thinking, people are going to be thinking about the materials they use. People talk a lot about concrete. People talk a lot about cement. The classic um, stats that people throw around is that if the cement industry were to be a country, it would be the third, third largest emitter in the world behind um, China and the USA. Um, but there are, there are reasons for that. Um, concrete is affordable. It's durable. And it can be quite local, um, which is a key um, sustainable concepts also been around forever. Um, I mean, all the engineers um, around, uh, amongst you will know that concrete's not new. The Pantheon in Rome, built around 120 AD, 2000 years ago, it's a fantastic engineering structure. It's got the largest unsupported concrete dome in the world. But people are looking for alternatives, and that's ways to reduce the carbon budget. I mean, people are looking for alternatives, concrete, um, whatever. It's not just using wood. There are many alternatives, and that's the great thing about the construction industry, um, looking for innovation in the way that they can um, proceed. But carbon budget, well, another possible change is you might see changes to um, legislation. You might see changes to the um, building regulations. Look out for what's happening to approved document L, which deals with the conservation of fuel and power. And that works with new and existing buildings and and dwellings, but also have a Google, have a Google look to see about partz.uk, approved document Z. Um, this is an initiative by a number of the, of the construction companies. Have a look, you, I mean, it's pretty much all the major construction companies seem to be um, supporting this. It's a proposal to amend the existing build, um, building regulations to consider, consider or introduce the mandatory reporting of carbon emissions actually what it really is is the ultimately the idea of legislation to introduce um the contractual carbon carbon budget through um the building regulations um it's, it's, again it's an example of the, the construction industry looking for ways to reduce embodied carb, carbon impacts you know not just in line with the national net zero pathway but you know going beyond that to see how much better they can do but again, it's all about their reporting and monitoring progress. It's all about measurement, reporting, reducing. It's all about going to be aligned targets. And these, I think, it's going to be one of the bigger changes to um, the way we work. And again, it's another, it's another layer of admin. I can see that there, there's a burden. I can see that there's a cost there. But it's going to be very much part of the um, construction contracts. And another issue that we're going to see issues in relation to biodiversity. Um, the environmental bill, which is one of those part of the post-Brexit um, le legislative framework. Um, the purpose is to address biodiversity. It, again, it requires targets, plans and policies. It talks about the biodiversity gain, a mandatory provision by which a development will need to achieve a 10 percent net gain. But that's not just during the construction phase. Um, it talks about the life of the building. And again, that's concepts that we should be becoming more familiar with because of the adoption of BIM and digital design. We no longer talk about the design and construction. We're looking about the operative phase 
of, of buildings as well. So then you've got management maintenance issues. Who's going to be responsible for this, for achieving these gains? And this the second thing element that's introduced by biodiversity is the conservation covenant. It's voluntary, so it might not take place. But if you do agree, you'll enter into a legally binding written agreement, which will bind successors in title to con con conserve the natural or heritage um, features of the land. Um, and one of the things that um, Fenicelli, I've been very pleased to have been part of, and again, it's another website that you really should investigate if you're interested in um, contractual obligation. Interesting to see what type of clauses there may be um, in my contract. Um, it's the Chancery Lane Project, chancerylaneproject.org. Um, and it sets out a number of um, proposed clauses. They're there for discussion. They're there for comment. Um, and and you, I've got some examples up on the screen. And I think Stacey will talk about some later specific to the um, JCT form of contract. You've got clauses to incentivize building contractors to propose modifications, clauses about account accountability, clauses requiring people to utilize open space in an environmentally efficient manner. Now that does sound a bit woolly. What does that actually mean? But it's that, but these, some of these clauses are there to make people think, what do we need to do to address the green issues, to make our projects more sustainable? What are the things that we need to think about? Um, and there's also a um, clause to um, introduce a formal um, carbon budget and other clauses to impose contractual obligations in respect of the use of materials and waste management. Now, that's not such a big step from what we have already because of all the various waste regulations that um, um, we're all f familiar with. Um, and it's not just about contractors and, and building projects. Um, all these changes, I mean, they 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 affect um, you know they affect us they affect us lawyers too. Um, Fenwick Elliott are a signatory to the um, greener lit litigation pledge, and it's exactly what it, say, it says it is. It's um, what steps can you take to make litigation more sustainably better? Um, obvious things, but the things that affect day to day life for all of us: um, avoiding printing, obviously, using public transport. Who knew? Um, when it comes to witnesses, I'm um, giving evidence by video link. But look at the bottom one. Use suppliers and service providers who are committed to reducing their carbon footprint wherever possible and appropriate. And that takes us right back to some of the things that Stacey um, was talking about in relation to um, contractors when they actually want to actually get on a tender list, the steps that you have to take. It affects us all. Um, and looking, moving on a little bit to um, look at some of our standard um, form contracts. And I think, as I've said, one reason why the Chancery Lane project is so important at the moment is that the standard, standard form projects, um, they've got a lot of catching up to do. Um, the FAC1, the Framework Alliance contract, already um, makes some provision for introducing sustainability targets to their contracts. They talk about project briefs. Um, and you, people need to set out the requirements in relation to sustainability and the operation of the completed project. So again, that's a great scope for what the um, what parties should do. They also have a um, helpful to see there's a definition of sustainability in the construction terms of the FAC1. It's measures intended to reduce carbon emissions, reduce the use of energy or natural unmade resources, improving waste management. A good one, improving employment and training opportunities. That's all about people. Um, we talk a lot about the technological advances and, and all that type of thing. But it is key at its forefront. It's about us. It's about people. And the FAC1 um, rightly recognises that. So it's there. It's a start. So what about FIDIX, a contract I know well? It's a global international um, contract. Well, there are already standard clauses requiring contractors to consider the environment, to consider the protection of the environment. You know, the contract expressly incorporates requirements of contractors to comply with the applicable law to comply with the environmental impact assessment that you got at the beginning of the contract. So it's protect the environment, limit damage. Um, these are general obligations tied to national legislation, tried, tied to national standards. Um, and they're a good example of what will become the historical way of dealing with sustainability, dealing with environmental provisions. They're good, 
but as FIDIC recognizes, and we'll come on to that in a minute, um, they could be better. But interestingly, there are differences between the way in which the, 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 the various FIDIC forms, the yellow, red, um, and silver books operate. And it all comes back to what I was talking earlier about the endeavors question. What are the actual specific obligations on the contractor? Um, the red book and yellow book, the, the, the standard contracts, the green books, the, the short form contract, they require all measure, necessary measures to protect the environment. The silver book, the EPC form of contract, talks about reasonable steps. And again, you can see the difference the yellow and the red book talking about um, limit, limit, limiting damage to operations and or activities. EPC contract only talks about operations, not activities. So the contract is not expressly required to limit the wider impact of its work outside the actual construction activities. So that's what it looks like here and now, but this may all be um, changing. Um, as FIDIC has introduced a climate change charter, it's coming out any week now, and it's going to be a focal point for sharing and promoting best practice around net zero and climate change. Um, and FIDIC recognise address emissions throughout the whole lifetime, the whole life cycle of a facility. Again, that's a big change in mean, the way we change in the way we are operating. Um, but one of the things that FIDIC have talked about um, is there are going to be changes to the FIDIC contract conditions. And I think this may well include the adoption of the charter, but that's very much a watch this space um, issue. And we'll, we'll see what those changes are I would imagine very, very shortly indeed. So with that, I will pass back to Stacey, who's going to talk about the JCT terms. I think I think it's my turn. I cannot hear Jeremy. Um, I'm hoping everyone can still hear me. So I'm sure someone will let me know if you cannot. Um, right, so I am going to just say a little bit about the the JCT, the contract situation in relation to the JCT, and fantastic, thank you to the audience for letting me know that you can hear me. Um, thank you, uh, JCT, right. So where are we gonna start here? The, with JCT, sometime now, but we've got the JCT guidance note, building a sustainable future together. Now, this, this guidance note was produced to assist management teams, design teams, the construction industry and its clients, both public and private sector, in dealing with environmental uh, sustainability within contracts used in procurement and construction projects. Now, a really good starting point um, for just how parties can introduce uh, introduce appropriate appropriate sustainability drafting into their construction contracts. Now, where we are today, JCT contracts are likely to be amended beyond this guidance. No to include even stricter obligations for controlling and managing emissions um, as the governments and the regulators now are setting new limits. Um, but it, within, within that note, it's referring to the, 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 the framework agreement. I'm gonna take you through that for just two seconds, if I may. Um, it starts with JCT framework agreement 2016 that starts with clause 5.1.5, with the overriding framework objective. And one of those objectives included is improvements in the environmental performance and sustainability and reductions in environmental impact. I mean, that was really setting the scene there. And moving on to clause 16, here's where we get the sustainable develop, development and environmental considerations. Now this clause, general these are general provisions requiring the parties to the agreement to explore ways in which the environmental performance and sustainability of instructed works or services might be improved and the environmental impact reduced. Now, parties may agree how such reduction of an environmental impact is measured and by whom. I mean, that's really important. How is it measured and by whom? Now, if an employer is going to require a project to be net zero, then how should this be measured? Um, that needs to be clearly set out within the contract documents together with any project specific requirements. And indeed in the JCT guidance note, it goes on to say such a provision would be supported by setting out specific requirements in the form of measurable targets. For example, the level of rape waste reduction and tying those requirements to performance indicators. 
Um, there we go. And then, and then also in the framework agreement, we see clause 10.2.5, and here's where it's bringing in um, the supply chain. Really important, obviously, to engage with the supply chain if, if we are going to achieve these targets. Um, here, it's requiring the provider to consult with and or involve members of its supply chain when assessing and improving upon environmental performance and sustainability and reducing environmental impact. Now, we also have the JCT Constructing Excellence contract. Again, it's got similar provisions, a similar provision at clause 12.2 with, with around the sustainable development and environmental considerations. Now, these are supplementary conditions. However, they are going to apply if they're not deleted uh, in the contract particulars. Now, this clause encourages the supplier to suggest improvements in environmental performance, and it requires the supplier to provide the purchaser with all information that he reasonably requests regarding the environmental impact of the supply and use of materials and goods which the supplier selects. So here we see again, the reporting element of it and that golden thread of information. Um, ever so important if we're going to achieve um, these targets and, and successful outcomes. Now, both contracts, the, 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 the framework agreement and the um, constructing excellent contract, both contain provisions to review the sustainability of a project through performance indicators and monitoring. And these provisions, you know, these provisions perhaps could be given greater importance by making these sustainability targets or carbon emissions conditional requirements for practical completion, um, taking it to that to that next level. Um, and if we're talking about completion, I wanted to just, if you haven't heard about it already, I wanted to draw your attention to um, the government soft landing document, the government soft landings document. Now, this, um, because I think what we're likely to see here is not just with the JCT, but other contractors, contracts as well, potential amendments in the UK, which are going to align themselves with um, the UK government soft landings document approach to completion, as well as performance reviews post completion for up to three years. Now, this is a different concept here. And if you're not familiar with the soft landing doc document, I would, I would highly recommend having a look. It's been updated recently, um, 2019, to align with the, um, the 19650, the BS 19650 um, documents. Now, for those who don't know, soft landings, that's defined as a process for the graduated handover of a new or refurbishment facility where a defined period of aftercare by the design and construction team is an owner's requirement that is planned and developed from the outset of the project. So this is a gradual handover or there's more requirements after post-completion. Um, now, what, I just wanted to point out one thing also in the, in the government soft landings document, um, the scope and principles of this document. So they're including for a smooth transition from construction to handover and close out and then into the operation of the facility. And it goes on to set out a number of, of points here um, around um, how this is achieved. And it's talking about post-occupancy evaluation, a defined period of aftercare, um, I'm not going in order, as you can see, I was working from the bottom, but nevertheless, um, I encourage you to look at uh, those points because um, the government soft landings document, it's, it's requiring the definition, it also requires the definition of target performance outcomes. And one of these target performance outcomes is an environmental performance outcome. And they have a table in there, which is, is, is rather specific. Um, um, so one needs to be familiar with it. Um, but these targets are to be regularly reviewed and evaluated according to the project's information exchange program um, and the handover and aftercare activities should be used um, to continue evaluation of this performance to assure that these targets are achieved. That's in part four of the document, really tying it into this environmental performance outcome. Um, now, Jeremy, I don't actually know what Jeremy said because I could not hear, but I know Jeremy spoke about the Chancery Lane project. <laughs> so I'm not going, I'm hoping that he covered that sufficiently and you now know what it is. And I'm just going to focus on Mary's Clause because Mary's Clause is specifically related to the JCT. 
Now, if you haven't if you haven't heard of this before, Mary's Clause proposes amendments to the JCT design and build contract to make energy efficiency part of practical completion. Um, what it's doing is it's inserting additional clauses into the contract, one at clause 2.1, which is a general obligation for the contractor uh, to at all times when carrying out the obligations under the contract to seek to promote the environmental requirements and re environmental requirements is defined. So you're adding a new definition into the JCT contract. And I've set that out there for you at the bottom of the slide and the environmental requirements um, I won't I won't take you through it, but that is is defined. Now here we see the word promote um, could be changed potentially for more and more onerous comply with these environmental requirements. I think whether or not that's going to be acceptable to the contractor will likely depend on the contents of the environmental requirements and what the parties are able to agree. Um, also in, 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 in uh, Mary's clause, again, it's dealing with design obligations um, and it includes a requirement for the contractor when designing the works and in selecting the goods, materials, plant and equipment for the works, again, to promote or otherwise uh, the environmental requirements. Now, as with all design obligations, this is a subject, um, this is subject to the standard of reasonable skill and care or as detailed in the contract. Um, now, this is this is the, um, an interesting element of Mary's clause. It's inserting yet another uh, clause, an EPC obligation. Now, this is what it's saying essentially is when assessing whether practical completion of a section or the works has been achieved, the employer's agent is not to issue a certificate until the EPC obligation has been met or an alternative agreement reached with the employer. Now, again, EPC obligation is another definition that has been defined and you would insert, amend the contract and insert that in. Now, if what it's saying is if the EPC obligation cannot be met, the contractor is required to undertake remedial works, including retrofitting to achieve the EPC obligations or improve the energy performance of the works, provided that such remedial works do not exceed a percentage, initially pro proposed at 10%, of the contract sum. Um, I've set out there for you what the um, EPC obligation is, is, is currently defined as, but the, the point here is, is that there, there is, uh, the Chancery Lane project has proposed an amendment to the JCT um, contract, which is worth looking, about, looking at and, and considering. Now, of course, there are going to be possible further incentives and amendments that can be made to the JCT and other standard forms. Um, per, perhaps such as the contractor having to recycle materials already on site in order to reach waste performance targets, waste performance targets. Perhaps the design and life of the building have to meet a certain um, emissions uh, criteria or requirements. Now, these, all of these, and Jeremy may have even mentioned this previously, um, these potential new obligations and conditions, they all raise the possibility of a green termination or a green liquidated damages clause, um, which could be triggered if a contractor or others uh, fail to meet these required environmental standards. Um, so in conclusion, and I think um, um, we, we will wrap up here, but um, if, these future contractual obligations are going to be met. Um, we can see that there's a real drive for requirements that are going to increase measurement, monitoring, management, mitigation, predicting, but a real emphasis around reporting, and then subsequently consequences if these targets are not met. Um, we've got the JCT guidance note, um, JCT provisions, the Chancery Lane project, all of these are a really great starting point if we're going to achieve these, these targets through contractual obligations. Still some way to go, and my view is that the devil really is in the detail. Um, it, hopefully you can still hear me. <laughs> the devil is in the detail. Um, um, and if we're going to have these success, successful projects and outcomes, we're going to have to um, discuss, get advisors in at the outset um, to achieve these targets. And as we just mentioned, and I'm, sh I'm sure Jeremy did as well, expect to see increased reporting obligations and requirements for providing this information and data 
you're, we're seeing the golden thread left, right, and center you know, across the board, um, and it's really it's really on the rise now. And I, I just wanted to end by just just a quick reminder. Today's focus was on procurement and contractual obligations, but it also takes people changing mindsets, changing ways of working, collaboration, innovation, and technology if we are going to tackle what I would define as monumental environmental issues that we're facing. And it's going to take more than procurement and contractual obligations, but ever so essential um, and not to forget. So I think that is um, where we are going to end on. I don't know if Jeremy can see some of the questions that have come in or not. I thought I, 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 I can probably take one of the questions that have come in. Jeremy, shall I, shall I go for that? Yeah, okay. Um, let's see what I can, can find. Right, I'm gonna take a question. I just spoke about Mary's Clause. Um, I'm gonna take a question on Mary's Clause. Mary's Clause changes the definition of PC in the JCT design and build contract, but isn't this just perpetuating the, the traditional silo mentality? by putting the responsibility firmly onto the contractor's shoulders. On the face of it, this doesn't feel like it is encouraging collaboration or have I misunderstood? I mean, I think that's a really great question. Um, I'm not sure Mary's clause is actually about changing the definition of PC. Um, I think what it's doing is adding a condition that you have to meet, which is what PC is all about anyway. Um, so achieving PC, it's about meeting that list of, of conditions, and this is just one more of them. Um, JCT, um, the DMB contract, it's not that it's not about collaboration, but having said that, it's not that collaboration can't happen. Um, you know, early involvement of the contractor, um, working through ideas at the outset, managing expectations, defining those expectations within the contract, um, you know, that can be a form of collaboration and achieving these successful outcomes. Um, so I'd suggest that um, um, on the face of it, possibly not, not changing that definition, but add, adding to it. Um, I don't know if Jeremy, you want to add anything or if you've yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. Th thank you, Stacey. And that is a good question. Um, and I think also it ties in with what Stacey was saying in relation to the government's uh, soft landings, the GSL um, system. Now that is perhaps a more collaborative approach um, that perhaps sees a softer definition to um, practical completion. I do think that that's one of the changes that we're going to see over the next few years. That is going to be a change to the way we deal with and define taking over or practical completion to deal with issues such as the um, what Mary's Clause is trying to deal with and also some of the ideas in relation to um, digital design and, and the sort of and the owner occupancy there may be a sort of, rather than a sort of hard line is going to be a sort of a more softer line um, just very briefly um, there's a couple of other questions that came in there was one right at the start um, talking about whether carbon audits should be carried out for construction works and I was pleased that we were able to deal with that i think very much the answer to that question is yes it's really one of those ideas which is um gaining traction and i'm pretty confident that we will see that um introduced um the other question that i saw um talking about the impact of, of mainstreaming nature-based solutions to climate change and what impact that might have on the um construction um industry um, I mean, I, I think the answer here is the construction industry is, um, well, as, as we've both said, they're actively looking at alternatives. Some of these are going to be um, obviously nature nature based. I've talked about the resurgence of of wood. I mean, I'm not quite sure what is meant by mainstreaming, um, but it seems to be rather obvious to me. I think that innovation in the construction and engineering industries um, means that they're far they're the head of the game, they're ahead of the bar um, when compared against with the progress of the politicians and, and legislation. I think that just reinforces something that sort of Stacey um, was concluding on. So I think, yeah, you know, um, construction industries are actively looking at alternatives. Everyone wants this to succeed. 
um, and you know, and, and that's the reason we highlight some of the issues in relation to the contracts now. We're not being difficult. Um, this one makes sure you know make people aware to make sure that every, every everything every, everything's able to move forward um, successfully, um, which is what the desired outcome for everyone. So that's all I have to say. I'm not sure how I'll communicate that to Stacey, but I'll just put a thumbs up and hopefully she'll, she'll know that I finished. Right. So have you already yeah. discussed? You've already no. Okay, great. So I am going to to wrap up by saying um, a huge thank you for everyone um, for bearing with us today. Um, Jeremy, I think we did great on collaborating without being able to hear each other. So I think that's a real testament to uh, teamwork. But anyway, um, I do hope that everyone can join us next week where I we will have sound for both of the speakers and both of the speakers can hear each other, um, where we will be discussing Claire King, partner of Frank Elliott, and Sanjay Patel, barrister at Four Pump Court, who will be discussing prolongation costs in construction projects. Um, really topical, constant questions around this. It's, go it's going to be lively, and I really do hope you can join us. It's next week, 11th of November, um, Thursday, same time, 12 o'clock. And thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for bearing with us. And we hope you are safe um, and sound where you all are, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much for joining.